So I don't know whether to say good morning or good afternoon, or so I'm going to say good noon. Thank you all for coming. My name is Michael Keller. I'm the university librarian. I'm delighted to welcome you to this presentation by Miley Sreps, the Minister of Education and Research of the Republic of Estonia since November of 2016. She's held the same position earlier, for 2002 and 2003, and in 2005 to 2007. I have to say I've met several ministers of education and research, and they all share the same qualities of intense interest and engagement with the educational system and the research possibilities in Estonia. And they all share the same characteristic of being incredibly cooperative in coordinating their work with other ministers and leaders of the educational establishments in the country. Malice Reps has been a longtime member of the Rikigogu, the Estonian parliament, and she's been elected to the Tallinn City Council several times. From 2000 to 2009, Malice Reps lectured on European and international law and on international and comparative law at the Riga Graduate School of Law. She has graduated from the Central European University in Budapest with a master's degree in law and from Maastricht University with a master's degree in European public relations. She is currently obtaining a PhD in European law from Uppsala, the second most beautiful campus in the world. You can ask me later which is the first most beautiful. So please welcome to this podium Malice Reps, the Minister of Education and Research from Estonia. Malice, the podium is yours. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction. Um, I have to tell honestly, that's a long time since I've been introduced in academically, so I had to think over myself what I have studied in my life. So thank you very much um, for being here, and uh, it's uh, very, very difficult to uh, give you the full picture of Estonian educational system in a, such a short time, because we, um, as a ministers or policymakers, we always like to go into the very tiny details. So I will bear you before you start asking questions. If you ask questions about something very particular, of course, I will go into that detail as well. Um, like um, I was already introduced, I've been around an educational policy field since 2002. And even in a times when I'm not a minister, just politically I've been in opposition, then I've been in a member of a parliament committee on devoted on education. So, I would say quite a few years I've been uh, really in the center of uh, policy making of Estonian education. And I'm very proud um, of saying that because Estonia's um, education has achieved in a world class. And of course, we're very proud uh, to um, tell you if you are not following the education in general, that Estonia is now one of the top five countries by OECD uh, analysis in uh, two sequence studies and number one in Europe. We just passed um, uh, Finland with two points. So, uh, so that means that, um, uh, and there is a current, uh, currently going on a new PISA, which the results we will get in a year, and we are very optimistic about that. In addition to the general education, what we are comparatively studying all the time around the world, we're looking into the uh, pre-primary, which OECD now does the first time, and uh, they had pre-primary, meaning kindergarten studies or anything before six, seven. Um, and they had the first uh, preliminary study and they already said that um, we're doing pretty good in that also. We are not um, <clears throat> going only into the PISA today. I would um, start out of saying what, what are the, um, the questions and answers what we all asking or all around the world today is what are we going to teach or what are you, what is the aim of education now when everything is changing all the time and, and there are so many new approaches? So what should we keep and what should we change and how much should we revolutionize? And, and I would say that education, of course, needs to be not a follower. Not, uh, we don't react in education. We need to be all this, the social drivers because through the education you can change very fast the society, in a way, very fast. Because if you educate educators, because the teachers are the key word and principles there, and then, and then it, it drills down to the students and, and they 
all of a sudden they are already decision making themselves and they cha and they really change the society. Estonia's changed the last 30 years, a bit less than 30 years, it's been amazing. There's a, a, a huge, there's nothing comparative to what, what it was in no sector whatsoever. And, and the education has been always in the center of that because Estonians have always believed in, a, in uh, investing heavily in, a, in a education. Of course, in Stanford, you don't need to explain that. What does it mean? But I mean also emotionally. It's always historically been so that, that uh, the first kid in a family got the farm and second was sent to study. So there was always this thinking that if you don't inherit the land, then you inherit the brain. Like, you, you go and, and devote uh, yourself for something better. But um, this, uh, all these social changes um, in education, then um, you would probably believe that Estonia has done something uh, absolutely revolutionary in education. And then I come down to say that actually we're very conservative. Our educational sector in general, is uh, we start our compulsory education on the age of six, seven, but 97% of all children go to kindergarten. So basically in the age of one half to three, almost everybody is involved in educational sector already. Um, in addition to that, our kindergarten teachers are highly educated educators. They have the, either the bachelor, undergraduate or graduate level um, higher education in, in educational field, which is rather unique in the world. Plus, they are systemized, so you actually have the pretty equity system already in a kindergarten. So it doesn't matter really what area of a small Estonia, but still, what area you go, whatever kindergarten you go, there is a national curricula, and you follow before the school already certain things. The second um, thing, when you go to primary level, which is, of course, compulsory education, um, it's relatively um, one of the most equal systems in the world. Um, according to OECD studies, what happens in Estonia is that uh, you can be in a worse socioeconomic background. Once you enter this education, you can come out with the best academic results. So the, the, all the differences is possible to be um, uh, leveled up in our education system. But what is more in important is that all the debates about education in a society and being a social change is about understanding what do we expect. There is a debate, uh, again, internationally, that there are new skills what we, uh, we need to have, the personal skills. What are the skills, of course? It's a creativity, risk-taking, being open to the new ideas, um, thinking about problems, asking uh, right questions, learning to uh, be constant um, uh, problem solvers or, or uh, learning the skills to be lifelong learners. These are all the things that we are, we are putting down. There are national programs on that and, and funny enough, Estonia actually follows its education national programs. So if we really put down the aims, agree with, uh, with our institutions, then it, it is actually also followed. However, now comes to the very uh, basics. We, our education system is relatively conservative in terms of having the basic knowledge. We love all this creativity. We love all this question-making, problem-solving, after you have learned the facts. We love digital. Almost everything you, have, you know in Estonia is digital, after you know the facts. So you first learn things, then you come to the seminar, and then you're discussing. Most of Estonian teachers would say, it's lovely that you're debating, but I don't like to listen to stupid people. So first you study the things, you read the books, you do your homework, and then you come to the classroom, and then we cherish that you actually open, you ask critically, you open with us to go to the museum, you go to outside of a classroom, you do extracurricular activities. We are ready to accept your credits from extracurricular activities, from art school, from music school, but you need to do the basics first. 
And this is, I think, one of the things which I need to remind sometimes the international um, meetings like that, because uh, all these beautiful things like new skills and things, people keep thinking sometimes, un unfortunately, that that means that uh, you don't now need to anymore. Like digital, you still need to read and write. You need to still use your pen. You still have your motoric skills developed in your childhood. And then you get the digital. Digital is not replacing the paper, but it's just another method. We have, for example, robotics in our kindergartens. Now, more and more uh, schools are having coding from the first grade. And that's a part of our understanding of a new literacy. You need to have your good literacy in, in books, and then you need to have a good understanding of what the computer is. Because you don't want to be a user forever, you want to be a creator. But that doesn't mean that it replaces Zola or somebody else from international uh, literature. Classics needs to still be read. Yes, there is a constant debate about it, whether I can actually sometimes listen. But no, we demand that. And that's what makes us in a piece of different because, for example, of, um, of understanding functional reading skills are something what is lost in a way when we're becoming in a 21st, if we're becoming too stuck with our 21st century ideas. Another thing which is different from, uh, from some others is that we have uh, our compulsory agenda in education is still very full. We're giving our kids in their first years of school very little choice themselves. If you go to the school in Estonia, and that's the big problem sometimes for the pupils, especially if they come from international background, you get most of that what you get from a school nationally designed for you. However, having said that, teacher is extremely autonomous to decide what to do with that. So this is this thing what is, is very common in, uh, in some, of, um, some of the Nordic countries as well. So we tell you that you have to tell these things. Your subjects are designed, your topics are designed. But what order are you making? What sequence are you making it? What materials you're using and how you're doing it is up to the teacher. And we don't grade the teachers, we don't test the teachers, we trust the teachers. So we don't make a salary difference whether you follow my book or her book. Or if you don't use textbooks, or if you study in a classroom, or if you do it digitally, or if you do it in a very traditional way, we don't undervalue you if you're not up to the 21st things. But we really celebrate if you do something new. So we give you new diplomas and we give you uh, new possibilities or you get the new trainings or we, we celebrate you in a certain way, but we don't punish you if you are not in a, in a smartphone all the time. And that's what it makes, because why I'm saying that it's extremely important, if we're looking at today, we are very happy about the new skills of the 21st century and we are all debating about it. But what is the problem there? is the feelings of a teacher, because the key word always is a teacher, it's always an educator. If in a few years ago, a few decades ago, the educator was in front of a classroom having a lot of authority because he, or mostly she, was a basis of information. She knew the answer to the question what the rest of the classroom didn't know. Now the classroom might know more, or if in two minutes ago didn't know, then Dr. Google helped. And in most of the cases, the teachers themselves don't feel confident because this source of information is taken away from them. The whole education has turned around because the teachers cannot use the same skills what they used to have. They are not having authority because of, the, of a source of information. The second is also very traditional authority. Kids are not scared of them anymore. So if you, don't, if you take these two things of authority away, that's, well, it was rather recent when you could beat the children in a classroom. So the kids are not scared of a school, and the kids don't get the only source anymore from a teacher. So now the teachers in a classroom 
having a, and the principles of, of a school, having a different reason to be there. We teach and help the kids to find a source. We, we teach them to think critically and so on. Why I'm saying so long with a teacher? The autonomy of a teacher is extremely important today, even more so than it used to be. And I think internationally, we need to keep together our hands and try to change the policies that we stop examining and testing our teachers because otherwise there is no revolution going to harm. In this situation where if, if you as a teacher don't have a choice what and how you teach and don't have this open relationship, you never start experimenting. And if you don't start experimenting, you don't take the kids to such a creative level. And that's why I'm such a strong believer in, uh, in autonomy of the teachers. Of course, we are aware that there are some risks and we need to see the seek, uh, and, and inspectorates need to have a certain rights, but still. So, the choice of a teacher to choose the materials, the methods, the means and everything is there. And then what, how we do it is, is mostly with the carrots. So if you do something interesting, if you take a new things, and teachers love to come to the courses and get new trainings, so if you get all of that, then you normally celebrate something. You, you get some extra benefits for that. Not so much normally with your money, but you get a good, I don't know, spa weekend with the trainers, you get new diploma, your, your principal is happy about you, they, they notice you better. And for example, with a digital also, we, we, we have daily allowances or, or we give you some, some new equipments, you can uh, get a new smart board, even though most of schools now have many of them. So. So what do, we, what do we have not lost in the system, but what I think is very important is arts and music. We have in the kindergartens and in the primary schools compulsory arts and music classes, all the way up to the end of high school. Unbelievable so, but it is there. And why? Because of creativity. There are kids who don't maybe like so much of the, of the STEM, they might not be so strong in science, but they can express themselves. Well, very often we talk about sports, but it's not only that. They can, they can get a very positive reaction also expressing themselves through the arts and music. And also extracurricular activities. In Estonia, what we believe very strongly is that if you you're get a positive experience at school, Maybe not so much academically, maybe you don't strive academically, but you get it through the extracurricular things, then we take these credits into your curricula. And, and what we're now doing more and more is if you even go outside of a school, and you go, for example, into the professional music school or wherever, then you can take these credits to the, your normal curricula as well. And they are recognized fully as well. Flexible pathways. This is the key word for everybody. We all uh, know that this is very important to understand that today we all study and re-study. But this flexible pathway means also, again, to having the basics there. The, the normal general education background up to the 15 to 18 to 20, we believe that that needs to be very, very strongly there before you start going to your uh, specialization, because you never know the way you need to specialize around. We also very inclusive education. Inclusive education means today that your classroom as an educator, as a teacher, uh, is very uh, varied. Of course, I don't talk about so much in a, in a language or ethnicity, but everything your historic background, your parents' education, your, yeah, your language capacity, but also your special needs. You may be very talented in some subjects. You might be very, very specially um, need support from some others. And that's another big challenge. Um, one of the reasons, one of the reasons why we're using now from this year on uh, into each subject, parallel textbooks in a paper as well as in a, in a digital way, is to develop further, yeah, each, each 
textbook what is Estonia has has a digital version. It's for free for schools to use it as well. So it's um, the the reason is that we want to develop further the possibilities to help teachers with uh, this extreme variety in the same classroom. By law in Estonia, you can have up to 24 pupils in one class, but in reality. Um, it can be very much smaller, sometimes a little bit bigger, but the teachers say this anyway is too much. Because today you have kids who, we, we, who are much slower, then there is a few who are in the middle, and then there is varies. That is very difficult to say nowadays what is a general classroom. And that's the reason why we see that if we could help um, the the, the teachers more, yes, with special stuff and so on, but also with the textbooks, that you can work digitally in a very, very varied ways, much easier than with a paper. And that's the reason why we really, really develop now, in addition to paper things, uh, digital. Because with the kids with, uh, with a special needs, there is a lot of studies and there is a lot of research and, and we're also working with uh, teachers who have got a special education and, and learn to help. And it's amazing what kind of research there is to help a different Asperger or autism and we learn them more and it, it changes all the time. But there is a lot of very talented kids who are losing out in this system. Because more we are inclusive in our educational system, less time we have to deal with the kids who might be very independent and anyway ready to study very fast. And, and what, what in the equity system we need to do a special attention to the ones who are talented and gifted. And that's why the digital things are giving this opportunity. I, I have studied a very interesting research in a, in a, in a, from Finland. Uh, from Lapland, they studied for uh, 15 years the kids with uh, very gifted children and said that in general what uh, schools do with uh, gifted children, give them more um, uh, class works because if the very good kid is in a classroom and is very independent and very gifted, then normally they say, okay, do additional uh, things. And second is to help the ones who are slower. And both of these things kids normally who are gifted hate. And what they normally do, what at least this research over the many decades said, was that by the age of 14, these kids start, start hiding or being embarrassed that they are specially gifted. So not to lose these, we're talking about creativity. They are most likely to be uh, further decision makers, policy makers, creators, whatever. So not to lose them on this inclusive and equitable society, which we in an educational field want. In order for that, we need to pay that special attention. And then digitally what you can do is to take them a world further. So if the others are talking about, I don't know, in, in a planet Mars, the kid who is further interested in that can, with the digital means, already be in another side of, uh, of a galaxy or in another galaxy already, and done all of that and knows them all. So these are the possibilities in the same classroom and at the same time still following the teacher and going with the teacher and having a teacher guidance. What we don't need, what, what we need to keep all the time in mind, what Estonia has done with digital, is A, we don't replace anything and we don't lose the teacher. It's very wrong to start thinking that digital means that you get this kind of digital, um, wonderful lectures and then the kids don't need to come to school anymore and, and don't need the teachers anymore. No, it's just another method. What, what is very good, very efficient, but that is uh, human contact, what is there, is, is very important, at least in this primary and secondary level. What is um, of a professional development uh, we need to also keep in mind is that teachers need to have all the time the self-confidence of uh, changes. Um, today, the, uh, one of the students asked a very good question and I, I started to think about it. Like, for example, what do we do if, um, if um, if a digital means is, for example, like I said, in a kindergarten we try to put the robotics in. In the primary schools we do the, the coding already from the first years onwards. We have now uh, more than a third of the schools on board who are doing a lot of different interesting things to, 
to having entrepreneurship and then creativity mixed with digital. So they are really already making the companies, they are already making a different things, um, the coding and new things. They are really um, uh, very, very interesting uh, talent shows there. But um, the cyber hygiene and cyber security is there compulsorily from the very early age. And, and the reason is, is very um, uh, varied. One thing that we all as the parents and the policymakers want from our education system is to have emotional stability and, and very strong um, safety. We want the kids to learn, but that we want them to be safe. But safe means today also digitally safe. We cannot hide them from all the social networks and communications. Most of the kids very often, they anyway spend a lot of time in the computers or smartphones. And what we have done now is that it's compulsory from the very first grade onwards that every teacher discusses what does it mean. For example, what kid, uh, kids, what kind of uh, um, pictures they can post. Of course, we know that all the platforms uh, demand that you are 12 years old, but in reality. Um, so what pictures you put up, the pictures never disappear. Whatever you write down, it never disappears. It's very difficult for a six years old to understand that maybe in 20 years later you, I don't know, you run for the elections and then you find out that your very silly childhood picture is put on a poster. These are things that you teachers need to explain in a, in a level they have, only they can do it. Parents, we try to do it, but sometimes the teachers portray in a, in a very good way because they know the children's psychology, they know how to relate to them, and they give very good examples. So what we have done is to give the, the national program to the schools, asking what they need to cover, and then that each elementary school teacher itself interprets this and explains. Also bullying. We're all very concerned and working with the schools of anti-bullying, but social and, and mental health issues nowadays are so much more, especially on the girls, so much more related to what happens in the social media. Again, something what we need to discuss and explain them, that the word said there hurts as much as what you say in a corridor, actually sometimes more. And this is before we get to cybersecurity, the cyber hygiene, and we come down to very early age because that is a time that they need to understand it's just another means and methods of communications, and they're doing it anyway. And it's very important that they understand that there are also the same rules there. Um, why I'm saying and, and, and staying a few minutes here, because this is something what, as a policymakers, we need to very much betray and discuss with the teachers. Because otherwise, there is a denial of, uh, like the normal answer is, I don't use digital, so I don't need to discuss that. Or, for example, uh, we are not using in our schools the communication through the digital. However, the kids are there, and this is something what we need to cover. So these are just a few comments. Maybe I was a little bit scattered of my notes, um, but um, as I've not lost most of you on a sleep, so means that you were following me. And, and I really, truly want to give you time to ask questions. Um, and I didn't give you a very basic overview of Estonian educational system, because as you have already come here, um, you might know. But if you please want to get a more detailed on, on something, I would be very happy to answer. So I don't know who is the brave first to Give me a guidance what direction you want me to discuss. Yes, please. This work? Yes, it does. I'm Eilif Tronson. I'm with Silicon Vikings. And thank you so much for your presentation. It was very interesting. And congratulations on passing Finland. <laughs> Finland gets a lot of attention around the world because of uh, the PISA ranking. So congratulations. Um, Finland does many things, innovative things, I think, around education. And one of the things that they are t trying out now is phenomenal teaching. So using phenomena and apparently creating teams around these particular phenomena 
to come at it in, 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 in different ways, from different angles and so on. Are you, what, are you doing something like this with, and, and is there any collaboration with Finland, even though you pass them now? Uh, I, I know that in many things there's close collaboration between Finland and Estonia, and is there also in the educational field, and have you looked at phenomenal uh, teaching, and is that something that is of interest to you, or are there other things that you're looking at hmm. in terms of moving forward with curriculum? Hmm. Thank you very much. Um, yes, um, first of all, uh, Estonia and Finland is only 70 kilometers sea between, so we have uh, a lot of uh, co uh, cooperation and collaboration. Um, the reason Estonia has reached whatever we have done is, of course, a cultural background is very similar to Finland and all of that. But let's be honest, most of the uh, reforms we have made, we still going and discussing with our neighbors. Um, it includes most of the cases all is Finland, and then we also have some others depending, for example, of some things we, we discuss with Denmark or, or Netherlands. So. And we're very open of new ideas. Of course, we know what, what they're experimenting and how they have built up their new curricula. Um, what, uh, what Finland has done is also having the resources and, and, and they have sold their educational excellence much better way. But having our background, what we have, and also the, probably the finances, we have done the selling point um, much less. And uh, the reason I'm here also because I was invited to speak, most likely, otherwise you would have not also met me, to know that, wow, we just passed to Finland. So this is, we, 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 yeah, we, we need to learn better what we, what, how to sell ourselves. This is one thing, and definitely we need to learn from U.S., because I think, the, the best salesmen are coming anyway from here. Um, having said that, a phenomena teaching or any other changes in curricula, the idea is, um, is very much so that yes, after the, you have got your basics, you starting doing more inter, interdisciplinary things and then you also uh, having a creativity and, and building it all up. There are some elements which many schools are doing, and we call it new approaches of learning, and we have a national program on that. We have followed it for the last four or five years now. And most of the schools are very open on that. Um, but if you go to every day, if you go to a random time into random school, it might be very conservative still. But then at the next day, you might have the whole um, day of a school built up in a in a in a phenomenal way, or you experiment. So not all the schools are ready to revolutionize the whole setup. So we don't lose most of the classroom setups or whatever, which some experimental schools do, and we also have them. But not all the parents are ready to do that. So what I would say we mostly do is, for example, I will give you another example. We now more and more trying to do so that our high school kids can take already part of their studies at the university level. So you actually can go in a high school and take the courses from undergraduate level with the idea to, if you really, let's say, the chemistry, then you can, once you enter the university, you go straight to sophomore year. You don't need to grow through that subject matters. You can go to undergraduates on some other fields, but on your very particular field, you enter already to the different level. It's not because the, the kids are hurrying, but we, we are so worried that kids get bored. So that's why we want to get them more tied to the universities. And there are great success stories in that, but it's not the mainstream. There are few schools who are very tied, and then the kids are already going to these schools knowing that. The same with phenomena teachers. There are some who do very interesting things like that, and then you go to the other side of a, um, of a, of a city maybe, and you get a very traditional school. Reason, parents are not ready. So, and, and, and in a way, I, I cannot tell behalf of Finland, but in a way it's, it's similar there also. Some parents who are open for that, they do. And what our, us as a national policy makers, what we need to do is to give these uh, tools to the teachers. And teachers can do them in the classroom 
and do them step by step and then show that there are good results and then they do it um, more nationally. That's the way how we have, for example, introduced our digital as well. It's been absolutely voluntary. Every school can decide itself. At the end of the day, all the schools have applied it. So the same, I would say, phenomena or interdisciplinary or uh, entrepreneurship, all of these programs have come step by step. I think that was first. Yes, please. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, amazing and inspirational uh, speech. Uh, Estonia has always been sort of a leader, so it's great to see that you're past Finland. And congratulations yesterday at CES for winning the award there. Um, I'm Anar Simpson. I'm a global ambassador for a STEM program that was founded here in Silicon Valley and is now in over 100 countries. Uh, we make sure that young girls around the world, from Armenia to Zimbabwe, um, are interested in science and technology, show their entrepreneurship, and you know, really sort of uh, get a taste for it. Uh, the question I have for you is the following. Um, you said that for the gifted students, you know, you're taking a different approach. Just recently, I think a year ago, the Khan Academy, which I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, Sal Khan's Academy, he came up with this notion, which is old, but they're now introducing it into their way of teaching, and it's called mastery. So mastery means that you could be in grade two or you could be in grade six, but clearly not everybody's going to be at the same level in that grade. And so what the teacher can do is because the curriculum is digital, uh, right? You're looking at maybe e-textbooks or whatever, um, you know, a person can be in grade two but at this level and another person can be at this level and another person can be this level. You're still the same teacher, you're still the same school, I mean, still the same classroom, and you will still go to grade three, all of you, but your mastery of mm. algebra will be done even though you've moved to grade three. Say you didn't master it in grade two. You'll master it in grade three because before you can take calculus, you will have mastered it. So it's this new thing called mastery, and I think you sort of alluded to it for the gifted students, but if that could go to every classroom using technology, because you, you couldn't do it without technology, right? The teacher and 25 kids is not. So I'm just wondering if, if Estonia could do that. And then just a, just a comment. I've never heard the word hygiene, um, digital hygiene. I commend you for it. Because a lot of problems in our world come from that, from lack of hygiene, from lack of knowing uh, you know, what is clean, what is not clean, what is good, what is not good. And a lot of problems in our world also come from, is this a reliable source? If it's not, should I even be looking at it? Mm -hmm. And if you don't have that hygiene from the very beginning, you're lost, you're, you're done. So. Thank you. Mm. Um, thank you very, very much for your comments. Uh, yes, um, we don't call it mastery. We call it an Estonian program individual study plan. And uh, the teachers are doing it a lot. And the reason is also, if we come to the, the well, nowadays it's very difficult anyway to say who is a special kid because almost everybody is finally a special. But, but let's say still uh, the very special kids. Um, who have certain autism or Asperger's syndrome, very often they have um, the spectrum diagnosis and then they are very talented in a certain way. So in order to help these kids to get through the education and not lose them, it's very, very important to, to get them individual study plans. And the other thing, what, what is, there is a big debate about that. I know that the individual study plan also allows you to move faster I am very hesitant on that because of uh, bullying because, and also because of the social. I have uh, met a few times um, young teens who have been moved faster and they are, for example, in a classroom of, uh, let's say, they are 10 or 11 years old and they're studying together 14, 15 years old. And especially with uh, guys, they are coming down and saying, for example, sorry to say, but for example, their sexual development for one guy who told me openly that because of that, he for 10 years was scared to even address a girl because he knew all the time in sports that he didn't have something what the others had. So in a moment when he didn't even realize 10 years later he had grown up, he still had this, uh, this feeling about it. And also there is a lot of research saying that it's better to help them individually, but keeping the social ties with this. Um, similar age groups. 
So that's why I'm very, very strongly, I think the masteries and all the things which keeps the kids the same social kahoot, but giving them possibility to be really, maybe already in a master's and doctoral level, that's fine. But giving the social background and friendship is also something when they're later is very important. Hygiene, I think it's very important because we try to sometimes say it's cyber, uh, cyber security, and then we always imagine something, wow, you know, now we're talking about something, some, something very, very, very difficult. But if you talk to teachers that it's just a simple hygiene, then they come and, and open. That's why we're doing with uh, elementary schools a lot, and then the kids, and also the teachers are then uh, more willing to open themselves up because they understand what you're talking. Because not all the teachers are all the time digital. Well, they mostly in Estonia are, but maybe not then that way. They don't think of that way. Keith Devlin, a mathematician at Stanford, actually a recently retired mathematician at Stanford. Let me also add my congratulations about packing Finland, and I've spent almost 20 years working with Finland on mathematics education, so sincere congratulations on doing that. But I've also been to, been to Estonia several times, and I was actually over at Taltech Digital last September for the conference, and spent a couple of hours with Birgit Kau from Enov about issues in Estonian education. It was the thing you alluded to earlier, the thing that came across, and we spent almost the entire two hours talking about how you inspire and change the teachers to sort of adapt without throwing away the baby with the bathwater. And I'm curious to know what brainstorming you've done at the government level for changing that culture, the nature of the teachers, the, 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 the whole approach and the sense that they have about their job. The, the things that, even if they haven't been implemented, I'm kind of curious as to the thinking processes you've had as how to address that particular slice of the problem, if indeed it's a problem. Hmm. I, think, I think the key word is respect. I, I, I think the absolute key word is respect. Even, um, I, we, we really nationally, if you're looking at the education program, we respect every teacher. It doesn't matter if you're digital, non-digital. If you're very um, problem solving, if you are entrepreneurial, or if you are in your Late 60s, we have a lot of teachers who are 55, 65 plus. Uh, but you are doing very traditional thing, but you love your subject, you, you, you get people engaged around you. We don't tell you that you are too elderly or you know, you're outdated. So I think the, the key word is respect. Uh, the other thing is that um, I think we having more, we have that this hour plus and the minus, we have lost one generation of teachers between. We have great number of teachers of 50 plus, and then we have quite number of teachers, 20s, 30s. And that is one generation between missing, because that was the time when change was happening and a lot of possibilities was there, and, and especially in a, in, a, in, a, in a science block, you had other things to go. And, and because of this problem, we have also a benefit. Because now it's like um, the, the I don't, let's say, more experienced generation takes these young teachers as uh, naturally as they need to mentor them. So what this um, uh, experienced generation gives is this confidence of the knowledge. Like you need to know the basics. You know, the, what I said already, you, you cannot start having a problem solving class when they have no idea what the problem is. So first teach that, go there. You cannot go to museums before you have not gone through the things. Do the outside classroom things. They're fun things to do after you have gone through the theory. So this is what, what the young generation comes with, the crazy ideas, and they have gone through the world, and they want to do the, absolutely everything different. They have seen the open classroom, they've seen the new revolutionary schools in France, and, and Finland, and Denmark, and whatever, then you come on the age of seven, and you don't know what to do there, and everybody sits in their phone. They think that's fun thing. And then they get into the very conservative school, and then they get this nice mix. And I think that's been the good thing. Uh, but yeah, respect. I, we, 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 really, we really try to tell the teachers, you do what you do. Um, and the other thing what I would say is that teachers traditionally have been so open of new knowledge. It's amazing. Any training course you open up, it fills up in five minutes. 
So universities just, if we, if we would have more educators who educate teachers, they go to any course, any course. I would say we have now more than, I think last year there's more than, I don't know, thousands of courses. Teachers are the number one interest in, in educating themselves. Because maybe it's also be, they, they feel that they are more confident what they deliver, but this is also the key word. Just provide them information. Don't force them. They don't get any benefit out of that. Plus, only for themselves. Hi, uh, I'm a librarian here at Stanford, and thank you for sharing your vision and assessment of the Estonian educational situation. Thank you. Uh, I was actually a few years ago at a data, international data conference in, in Tampere, Finland, and afterwards I, I was deciding, should I go to Tallinn or Stockholm? And now you're making me regret that I decided to go to Stockholm. Tallinn is <laughs> much more fun. Yeah, next time, next time. So I, as a librarian, I, when you were talking about some of the attributes of great teachers, to me it also echoed what I think are attributes of great librarians. Uh, teaching about information literacy, really helping to support the whole teaching and research sort of mission of what's going on. Can you talk a little bit about the role of librarians and libraries in the educational system? Mm. And, and okay, Th thank you very much. Um, yes, next time you definitely come to Estonia. Welcome. It's uh, it's a wonderful um, wonderful place, and um, it's a small country, but you get a good variety. You can go to the nature and meet the bear and moose and boar and then, then at the same time you get uh, old town and, and medieval times. But coming from California I would say go in the summer. Go in the summer. <laughs> um, maybe it's a bit cool right now. It's, it's, uh, it's very snowy and freezing. And um, yeah. Anyway, um, librarians. Yes, um, we still have a school libraries, uh, which means that um, um, no, actually, I come a bit wider. Um, Estonia is, is a small country, but geographically, is um, we have 45,000, uh, 45, uh, I don't know your local. Uh, anyway, it's, it's a small country, but uh, it's, uh, there is rather big areas which have uh, much less populated. And there, the libraries are now the centers, together with education. There are kindergartens and elementary schools, and libraries are the only things which are left in most of the communities. They might not have a shops or banks or anything, but these are the ones which they have. So the identity very often is circles around the kindergarten, elementary school kind of building, where it's maybe very few left, and then a local library. So the librarians there are the ones who are giving you information. There's far more than books information services, also digital, as most of Estonian services, almost all Estonian services are digital. But not elderly generation might not know everything what to do. They come to librarian. They have access to the computers, they discuss things, they have a coffee there. So libraries are very strongly tied in Estonia as the local community identity. Same with uh, schools. Librarians are traditionally at schools. Also the one not only telling what books to read, but having most of the extracurricular responsibilities. School classes are over, you go to library. And then the librarians, well, they don't entertain you, but they, they keep you there. But what they keep you there is they actually teach you. And what they teach you is they do a few homeworks, they discuss what cat's name is, what's your favorite food, and this, this, um, this human interaction, what you get from the library, among which they guide you to the certain things. And quite a few pupils notice that the positive kind of guidance, what they have got, what their interest could be, having coming from librarians. So we still have at schools, each school has a library. And in a small communities, what they nowadays do is that they put the local community library and school library together. But not that they close the school library and move it to the community library, but they close the community library and move it to the school library. So actually the elderly generation then comes to the school building and having there also other things like uh, training courses or then what is very popular in our community libraries is that, for example, we have so-called uh, grandchildren teaching grandparents. 
uh, digital skills, other trainings, and, uh, and the kids really love it. And of course, the grandmothers mostly love it also. Grandfathers are few left, and they sometimes play bridge that time, but, but, uh, but the, the, the ladies normally are very interested in that. But in the schools, um, there's another thing, as in Estonia, schools are, um, uh, I didn't say that, it's, it might be also important. All our education is for free. It's, it's all for free, from zero to, well, kin kindergarten, there's a small fee what the parents pay, but uh, elementary school, everything is for free. And, and in the libraries, what very often happens is that the kids waiting for the buses, the school buses, which are also provided for you, the, or transportation, or you waiting for your extracurricular activities like sports or art or music or, or filmmaking or radio. And then meanwhile, it's most common thing to do is to go to the library. And, and so the time is efficiently used because the librarians are doing, and, and it's not only doing the homework, but I would say it's more of, of, yeah, the knowledge. So I would say they are very, very important. And very often the librarians are also, he, either they have, they have gone to the same courses as, or have got additional pedagogical degree as well. So appreciate it very much. Servus, and thank you very much for this fascinating and comprehensive overview of the culture, I'll say, of uh, Estonian education. I have two questions. I'm Scott McLeod, World University and School, which is like Wikipedia in 300 languages, including Estonian, and uh, Creative Commons for licensed MIT open courseware in five languages, not including Estonian language. Uh, first question, what's the role of basic science research um, say out of greatest universities, developmental psychology, in informing um, Estonian education in the Estonian language. Uh, Elizabeth Gunderson gave a talk here yesterday. She's a developmental psychologist. Um, she studies cognition in first and second year uh, for number lines. The second question is, um, if you could, in the Estonian language, offer MIT open courseware degrees centric degrees at the high school and university levels to maybe um, increase Estonia's educational standing relative to Finland um, into the future. Would that have appeal um, if your students could go online to MIT in a sense? Uh, and those are, yeah, role of research and uh, MIT open course for centric university in Estonian language in Estonia. Mm. Well, I start from a second. In terms of, um, it's 100 years of Estonian language, officially, um, this year. And I'm very, very proud of our small, beautiful, one fantastic language, which, which in, a, in a very good group with, uh, with Finland and other Finno Greek, which I have never found it very similar to Hungarian, but well, they tell that it is. Um, after studying there one and a half year, I found five words. Um, and they mostly are all international words, which are similar. But anyway, um, so I, I, I love Estonian language. But Estonians speak English and relatively okay. As young generation speaks, I would say, it's, it's a challenge to motivate um, researchers to do research in Estonia. And, and it's a very big national thing because it's a small language we want it to develop also in a, in a research. But So I would say... Um, any open courses we can do in cooperation, I would say that definitely it's a fantastic idea, but it doesn't need to be in Estonian. That would be my, uh, it would be my short reply. But uh, digital courses, mm, there are various success in that. Um, the, some young people really like it, and what in Estonian, what we have seen is more like a necessary. For example, if you are in Estonian family background and you, or you're just interested, you can um, go to this uh, digital courses in, in, a, in, a, in addition to something. But I have found very few who are interested in particularly having a full program in a certain, like an, at least not in teens, in the research level. Yeah, um, if there would be more interested in that, I yeah. I would be open, but it doesn't necessarily need to be in Estonia. Now research, if I understood you correctly, I would take it, if, if you allow me, the answer a bit wider. We're very strong believers in, uh, in evidence-based policy making. 
I, I, I think that's the biggest benefit. If I, if I look back to 20 years of policy making, when I've been in education sector, what has been the biggest change is that I don't think, but I can actually say, oh, the, that has been studied for many years. Education and field nowadays, pick all, all this cross disciplinary studies and, and, and all coming to technology, to, to STEM sciences, brain um, psychology, clinical things. It's, it's like we, ha we know so much more about our kids' development and we can make uh, smart choices. Well, we can make, we don't always make because it comes beautiful thing called democracy. But, but, but sometimes at least we we have a knowledge to make the right choices if we want, and it's our problem as a policymakers if we don't persuade our taxpayers enough why it's a good choice. So I would say how much it influences? Yes and no. It influences a lot uh, if, you, if you take certain research, basic research, and there is so-called evidence-based proof what do we need to change something? What is the problem is that uh, I cannot guarantee that every research is understood, or it's not that there is at least another five researchers who sell that you know it's not true, and 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 also our curricula development. I would say we are very hesitant in changing something in a curricula which has enormous effect and impact on a kids just on a basis of, of one or two pieces of information. So I would say yes and no. If there is something saying, you know, we need to do something completely different, I would say that information delivers into curricula maybe not faster than five years. And that needs to be a piloting, needs to be proof. We need to see whether it goes to delivers into textbook. Um, but at the same time, for example, you, you mentioned the girls before. Um, we have a lot of good experiences where research feeds into the examples, what we can practically do better in attracting certain, for example, minority groups or certain, certain problem groups. And these uh, particular policies, I can see direct, uh, direct impact, but maybe not so much on a generally. Yes and no. For example, I was just thinking like clinical research, uh, which is international, of course. For example, how we identify what support certain special needs groups need. There I can see direct results. There is a study, then the, the people get that, then it goes to the, the, the decision makers and they say, okay, there is a, for example, um, uh, I remember there was, uh, what, seven years ago, there was still belief that the concentration difficulties always comes with the with a very active uh, kid. And then something like, what, seven, eight years ago, there was, I think, it started from US, a very good clinical research saying that, no, 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 concentration deficit uh, can be with the kid who is absolutely quiet and sitting on a corner. So this, this whole thing, how we identified um, the, these kids uh, was revolutionized and turned around. So yes and no. Thank you. Hi, um, thank you very much for this wonderful lecture and overview. Uh, my name is Uwe Taylor and I work in med school here at Stanford. I come from Narva. Uh, which is a border city to Russia, over 90% population Russian. So my question, how does Estonian educational system address minorities, a Russian minority? What are your successes in assimilating this group into Estonian society and why? Uh, well, we have successes and, and, and no successes. Um, what in the last 30 years we have, um, we have done in Estonia is that our communities who would like to come to Estonian schools, and it's a very personal family choice, then the schools get support to help the kids. Um, that, that means that in a very, very many areas where um, Estonians are in a majority and, and uh, 
Russian speakers are in a minority. Um, the Russian schools have got very, very small, or they have been united or closed down with, uh, with Estonian schools. Uh, so the, in these regions, the, the parallel um, education system have, has disappeared. So what we have succeeded is that our Estonian language capacity or state language capacity on an exam level have got very good. Um, the end of elementary school, the, uh, the kids excel, they're getting good results. What is our failure or what we have not tackled is that, like you said, Narvav or the region which is mostly Russian speaking, the um, teacher quality in teaching Estonian language or teaching in Estonian varies. And there are schools where kids get their excellent possibilities to continue in uh, Estonian uh, in a university level. And there are unfortunately schools who we can still tell 30 years down the road, you, you don't have a good Estonian. So you, you grow up in a Russian speaking community and you don't get enough skills to continue and having uh, strength to continue in Estonian. Um, so this is clearly the problem. Um, there is a lot of ideas what how and to do, but um, if we are going to change faster than it has been so far, I'm not so sure. This will be the last question. Uh, hi, my name is Ivan Pimachenka. I'm from Ukraine. Uh, in Ukraine, I'm a founder of the largest massive open online courses platform, Prometheus so almost 1 million users now, and now I am a fellow at Stanford. So um, we are in a some, somewhere similar situation in Ukraine. We need to create you know, new system for teacher training, basically from scratch, like you did 30 years ago. So my question is how you was able to create such a system to prepare great teachers, because it's obviously important to give teachers freedom but it's also obviously important to prepare them for challenges of teaching. Uh, and yeah, this is my question, basically. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Ukraine is a wonderful country. Um, there is, uh, I've been there for six years um, in row as a rapporteur from Council of Europe, so I went there very, very often. So um, Ukraine and Estonia has its similarities, has its, its big differences, uh, geographically, culturally, historically. But, um, but what, what, can I, what, what could I generalize? I mean, one thing is you have a lot of things to keep. And uh, because you have amazing people, you have amazing teachers. So I would say that um, it's very... As a, if I would be today the Ukrainian policymakers, thank God I'm not, but if I would be having this huge, diverse country, I would say first message to the teachers is that you are amazing. Because the self, um, the teachers first need to have a self-confidence. And I think that's the problem of Ukraine, what I met people. They, having, they don't have that self-confidence. They think that, you know, of different reasons and, and, and having a very low self-confidence is difficult to move forward. You cannot change the teachers because you have massive amount of teachers. So you can only go with the teachers. Um, so first is the self-confidence. Second is a lot of teacher training. I think you have amazing possibilities because everybody wants to help, but um, not many countries know how to do it exactly. So to have this teacher training and, and, and having Having, um, having these possibilities to maybe renovate, to, to make it better. Because one thing within Estonia was essential, I would say, is all the international aid what we got to rebuild the schools. It's strange enough, but it's extremely important to have a good infrastructure. Um, like, for example, simple things like uh, we talk about uh, the, the different hygiene. But in a, it, it just, matter of fact, it's very important what kind of bathroom or restrooms you have in schools. 
it's it it is it's uh, it's it's also about uh, it's it's very important also for the security and safety of the schools. Um, I mean, most of the bullying in schools happens in the bathrooms, so on restrooms, what you call. So so this like having renovation, having infrastructure, having uh, possibilities for sports, for art, having just simply money for the teachers to have extracurricular activities because you don't have you have not lost all of that. What is what is good there. Uh, so I would say this international aid is very important, uh, but also, but also just the simple salaries and just simple salaries. Sorry to say, but the, and the teachers to have a motivation. I would say, well, I, I go to the basics, but Ukraine's best, biggest problem is what do we know? What is the biggest problem? So if the if we could, if the donors and international support go directly to the schools, so that. It's the overhead is not disappearing all the time. We could do much, much more. So I would say the key word there is if we can target the teachers and motivate the teachers. Sometimes it's not just a pure salary. Sometimes what I noticed in Estonia in these very critical moments was sometimes, like I said, for example, if you can take a teachers to the good training course in a, and give them per teams and a little bit motivation, they go back and maybe they go for half a year in a very shabby neighborhood. So so this is this is I would say what I would do. But I would not lose the teachers. This is the most important now for Ukraine. Thank, Thank you. you.